Uh, welcome to this episode of the Down the Put podcast. Um, I got, got my braces tightened today, so I'm a little bit lispy again, guys. I'm so sorry. Uh, but yeah, just we've got a, a good bit of stuff to get through. We got our first points of the season, thanks to Sweet Lord, and there's just been a couple of like little bits and pieces uh, around the club that we kind of wanted to uh, get talking about. And then obviously Gary's going to do his opposition corner. And uh, yeah, we've got a few bits and pieces to go through. So, uh, guys, how's it going? Good, quiet, quiet week in Wondrous Land. So, not much to talk about tonight. Yeah, definitely not. He says with a wry smile. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gary, I do want to apologize for uh, what, what Tottenham did. I, I'm, I'm so embarrassed. Mate, by... It's fucking disgusting. I rarely, I rarely get too angry with football these days. But I, I did bad things to the sofa cushion next to me as Sun was put through on goal, the title on the line, a huge gap to yeah. Ortega's left, I just yeah. to slot it into the net. I've seen him score that goal 50, yeah. 50 times, um, and he broke my heart. Yeah, uh, I, saw, I, I saw the guys over on uh, AFTV, like... Uh... Basically saying he did it on purpose, which is bullshit. Yeah, just, he did. He didn't do it on purpose. Yeah, he just yeah. bowled you're, it. you're right though. When you're watching it, you can see like it was just such an easy slot to the keeper's left. But uh, yeah, I just like like Ange afterwards, like you know, this club just seems to do stuff to people, like to good people that make them uh, angry at the world. And we saw it with Conte, we saw it with Jose, we saw it with Poch. We know we've seen it with Ange, where uh, the fan base and and. Uh, to well, to a lesser extent, to the fan base, but the the owners like just bring this out to people, and uh, yeah, it was just gross. Like, are you watching Arsenal as we're losing two 0 and all that kind of stuff? Like, I, I I don't like to let I don't like to let Arsenal live rent free in my head, and like I actually couldn't give a rat's arse if Arsenal like if Arsenal win the league, who cares? It is, whoever wins it deserves it, right? So mm. I just wanted us to go out and put a performance in because we've been shit. Like we've lost. Five out of six now, and it's like you know, uh, I'd rather us just put some points on the board. But um, and then we're probably going to finish six because Chelsea will win on the weekend, and we'll get beaten by Sheffield <laughs> Uh Well, that's that's enough boring uh, <laughs> Premier League talk. I seem to get that off my chest because I feel bad. Gary's just like looking at me like you with, with daggers. So we is, not to, not to continue with that. But it's really <laughs> it's really weird how like United played Arsenal with City on the line, and then Tottenham played city with arsenal like you know what i mean like how yeah. the rivals kind of actually played a card and both put in good performances like i like i thought spurs were gonna get three points united could have got three points i kind of feel like we took the foot off the gas pedal because we were trying to cause city but and i got i don't mean this disrespectfully anthony but the Spurs supporters essentially there to support City. It was just it was one that's, of the weirdest one of the weirdest football games I've ever watched. Yeah, to that's honest. that's what uh twenty twenty odd years or whatever it is, like since or whatever long it is since our last trophy win that uh it just it just does to you and you take solace and you take the wins in the worst places. Um so uh I, I did uh just before we uh, kick into the wonder stuff. Uh, I don't know if you saw it. Um, do you listen to the Football Weekly podcast, the Guardian one, Gary? It sounds like no. I used to. You listen uh, to no. I used to. I used to listen to. I listened to so many football podcasts in the week that that was the one I probably enjoyed the least. And the reasons why I'm not going to talk about because I know what you're about to say. Um, so I'm just not going to say why I stopped listening to it and carry on, mate. Yeah, because um, Bar- Barry Glenn Denning uh, is coming. To, I don't know how this guy is coming to Halifax, but uh, his, uh, his his sister lives there. Oh, okay. So uh, it was on Twitter that uh, it was a campaign to get him to come to Halifax, and apparently, or oh, to go to a Wanderers game, and apparently the club has reached out to him now, and he's going to go. So, uh, oh, sweet. yeah, um, which is kind of cool. As uh, and somebody has already. I, I looked at it last night. Uh, we're recording this on Wednesday. We're supposed to see Tuesday earlier. Uh, but somebody had already updated the um, the wiki, Wikipedia page for him. That, and I said, in 2024, he went to a Halifax Wanderers game. I know somebody went to the yes, but I'm, I'm doing that. So, well, I know, I know, I know. Denton is a free, uh, uh, frequent Wikipedia yeah. editor. So, so- you yeah, took the so, words out my mouth. I was gonna say it's gotta yeah. be Denton. It's gotta be Denton. I, I, I really hope it is. Uh <laughs> so uh Chris, I'm gonna I'm gonna try this this one to you. Uh uh let me see if I can do this. 
Oh, my days. We've gone high I know. tech, haven't we? I know. Uh, okay, are you ready? Let's see if this works. Josh, unfortunately, I come from a different world, I feel like. It hasn't been a hard week. I think it's you guys that are destroying these poor guys. I think there's a lot of negative comments, and we're not playing poorly. Um, I have to remind everyone, that's the league champs by 13 points. And we missed five big chances. So I'm not going to go on, this is a step in the right direction and all that stuff. I, I'm sorry, man. That's a great effort where you have a goal disallowed, um, you had five big chances, you hit the crossbar, and that's a valiant effort. So what's in the past is in the past. You guys can destroy these guys by all the comments that are made. It's all on me. If we lose, it's on me. But I'm going to protect these guys and stand by them. They're good boys. They work hard. It's not always going to come off, but our job is to support them. Um, I think it's really difficult to say supporters without support. Chris, what do you think of that? Like, just, I just wanted to make a little aside there that uh, it was Josh Healy who was asking that question, like the Wanderer's uh, notebook. And I don't think any of it was aimed at him. Um, I just think that he was the unfortunate one to ask a question for us. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what, what, what did you make of it? Um, I don't want to get down the weeds with it but i think it's definitely something that we need to uh to address like i said to andrew on twitter the other day 100 percent see where he was coming from was not a fan of the execution the reasons i wasn't a fan of the execution first the generalization i, I know pat listens to the show and and i will cross paths with pat in the coming weeks and months and maybe we'll talk about this and like he said the past is the past maybe this will be the last that's ever spoken of it um, but for every detractor, there's a dozen or more people that are supporting the club. Um, I've said to you guys off the air, I agreed with a lot of what he said. Um, he is right. In context, that is the best team from last year in its totality. The performance might not have been great. He says it wasn't a step in the right direction. I'm not going to say I beg to differ. If he feels that the direction was already there, then that's power to him. Um, he has belief in his boys and, and he has belief in the character of the squad. But my only real issue was, aside from the generalization, was saying that we're destroying these guys. And I say we're as in who is Patrice talking to? Um, that is a part of the question. And maybe something against, maybe something will come out of it. Maybe something won't come out of it. Um, I've said that if Patrice's goal was to control the narrative, to take the pressure off of the players, to you know say if any, if there's any fault, if there's any criticism, it's towards me. Uh, he's succeeded um, to an extent. It's a bit disappointing because I thought the boys played well. I thought that this is a early feather in the cap of the season. I personally thought it was you know not, not to you know undercut Patrice's comment, but I thought it was a turning point and a step in the right direction. Um, so, you know, I, I did feel bad for Josh, but Josh being the professional he is, I know, um, water under a bridge. When you ask a question, you're going to get an answer and he got an answer. Um, I'm not even mad at Patrice, you know, again, he's not completely wrong. We do have a, a support base and a fan base that can be extremely toxic. Uh, some of it irrationally, some of it from the history of the club. Um, as much as I love Steven, as much as we love Steven, the first four years of this club were difficult. And despite what Patrice and, and Jed and Jordy and Jan and the boys did last year, um, that history still lingers. Whenever a bad patch of form comes up, it's a reference to the past. I'm guilty of it being back on the air with you guys over the last few weeks and months, even talking about how some of Patrice's tactics remind me of the Stephen Hart era. And I don't mean that as a slight. I almost mean it as... Um, a compliment that he's he's taken some of uh, Stephen's ideas and it enhanced them and advanced them and has finally gotten uh, the best out of guys like Aiden Daniels, for example, Zach Fernandez. Not that Stephen didn't, but Patrice has taken that next step, which is what you want with the new manager. Um, it's it's an angle in a side of Pat I've never seen, which I think is something that's also kind of taken people aback a little bit. He's always seemed to be a positive guy with the media. Um, he's treated you guys like gold. It's been amazing seeing how much time he's given you guys. It's been amazing seeing how much time he's given the one soccer crew. Um, I know I seem to like be talking in circles right now, but that's kind of what the comments did to me. Um, the fact that we're doing this a few days later, 
I've been able to simmer and sit on it a bit. And, and to summarize more or less what I've been saying is I can see where he's coming from. I just think the execution and the delivery was a little bit off. I hope Pat doesn't hate me when he sees me next, but it's uh, it, it was a polarizing, a polarizing comment. And we saw the one soccer crew that Anthony, you just played the clip that they ran back. They doubled down on it. You know, the, the three guys on the panel decided to have some comments. I agreed with some of what they were saying. I disagreed with other bits and pieces, but the part that stood out to me was other journalists and supporters of other clubs coast to coast seem to have an opinion on it. And for the most part, it was extremely negative. And I think it's because, and and I'm going to leave this here, and I already said it during this spleel, but you know, if Pat's listening, it's the part that I really want him to understand is that as toxic and as negative as this fan base can be at times, that is the minority who you see on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Reddit. That's the minority. The majority of these guys aren't going anywhere. I've, been lucky enough as of as you anthony and gary as well we've had relationships with these players we've had relationships with their friends their partners their parents and we've always drawn that line underline we're not going anywhere no matter how bad things get we're going to be there to support you so part of being a supporter is having conversations with what's going on i want everybody in this ecosystem this podcast ecosystem this ecosystem that you guys have just freshly welcomed me back into, but I have was lucky enough to be on the show once upon a time. It's grown and it's changed and there's more voices and there's more opinions and not everybody has to fall in line into a cookie cutter opinion. That would make the scene boring. So yeah. my message to everybody who may have taken Patrice's words personally in a negative sense, don't stop doing what you're doing, but just be mindful of the fact that I think the undercurrent of Patrice's point Word to my mom, because this is what she said to me. The comments on social media, they read these things. These guys aren't getting paid six figures a week like the Premier League players are. Can't just roll off your back. These guys don't have PR people that control their social media. These guys do read that stuff. So would you want somebody coming into your workplace telling you that you're slacking off and you're not, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. There's a time and a place and an amount of criticism that you can put forward. If you think that this could be taken negatively, maybe think twice. And that's probably my my two cents. Gary, what's your thoughts? Um, I think it's a bit of a Rorschach test of how you feel about Patrice and how you respond to the comments. I think I think the best version, the best interpretation of it would be he's doing that thing that Jose Mourinho does, Alex Ferguson used to do, where when results aren't going well, you take all the pressure off your players and you make yourself the conversation point, whether that's in a positive way or a negative way. And he's done exactly that. No one is talking about individual performances this week. We're talking about those comments. So that's that's like the best, the best reading of it. Another reading of it, and not necessarily a negative one, I think, I think professional coaches in all sports control is hugely important to them and when I look at Patrice as a person and as a football coach I think control is very important to him you can look at it stylistically in how he wants his teams to have the ball he wants his teams to be the protagonists he wants his teams to control the game he doesn't like his teams to aggressively press because when you press you you cede some control because it's high risk high reward so his whole game model is built around controlling the ball and controlling the game when I think of his work ethic, again, it's built around control. He works 16, 17, 18 hour days because that is how he controls the success of his team. That's the only way he knows how to do it, by working harder than anyone else. Football is a game of variances and you you can't always control the result, but he's doing everything he can to, to get some control over it. So with all that in mind, when I see those comments, I see someone who, as Chris said, is trying to wrestle back some control of the narrative i think and i again i completely agree with what chris said where the people who are negative on social media they might seem and not not just negative but negative where it's a bit biting as well they they may seem very very loud but they very much are the minorities like we're all in group chats we all speak to our friends about it the only true negativity i see is on 
discussion groups on Facebook or Reddit or whatever, like, which isn't representative. But I think I think Patrice is still trying to kind of micromanage that reaction, which is just impossible to do. The, the only thing you can do to still have some kind of control is by disengaging with it and, and not looking at any of it because you can't control how people react. It's it's impossible. Um, and I think that's what he's trying to do with those comments. He's just trying to control the reaction and make people be a bit more, again, not people, make that minority be a bit more positive. Because again, like Chris said, the players read all this stuff and it's, if you're not the right type of personality, it can, it can affect your confidence and then affect your performance as well. Well, Paul, lads, um, I, I don't have an opinion on it. I'm just going to leave you two to uh, feel the rat. So, um... <laughs> but honestly, uh, in Patrice, we trust. You know, of course. I, I've, I've said this behind the scenes with you guys. I've said it publicly. I said it last year at the start of the year when people were already calling for his head. This year, there's people already calling. This is a man who is a genius, and he's learning his genius as well. So the grace that our supporters have given players in the past, the grace that our supporters gave Stephen Hart for a long time. I feel like not only does Patrice deserve that grace, but last year he earned that grace. So oh, yeah. again, I don't, I don't want to tell people to not criticize when they see things. I know that that's some people's outlet. It's some people's creative outlet. Look at us. Like, and, and again, like the other podcasters and bloggers and such in the city, you know, don't stop doing what you're doing. But at the same time, that toxicity, it can be turned down and should be turned down quite significantly, which is why, like I said, even though, you know, some of Patrice's comments rubbed me the wrong way, the basis and what he was trying to say and what he was trying to put forward, I do generally agree with just because I've been that sword and shield for this management group now for six years, personally speaking. Um, and that's why the comments weighed heavy on me to an extent, because I have put time effort you know sometimes a waste of time um trying to defend and trying to support um you know i just really 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 hope patrice realizes like gary uh emphasized that these loud people are the minority and they're a solid solid minority yeah it's like you know it's, it's like about anything in life it's like uh you'll always have you know it's like that thing in the simpsons uh i don't know if you remember the episode when they, they bought an elephant and the elephant like went in and just kept the stamp he went in and just kept like headbutting the other elephants and it's like sometimes in life there's just people like that in home where I was doing it to the guy. Uh so yeah, let's <laughs> let's uh, let's leave all that behind. I just I I, I really want to get into um the, the lineup here, Gar. Uh so it was great to see Coimbra back. I thought he was fantastic and I, I, I think he brought quite a lot to the team. Um a lot of what you had said in your opposition corner came to fruition. I thought that Charlie Trafford was very key to the game and when he went off things changed quite a bit. Um uh, and we also went back to uh three central defenders at the back. So what did you think of the question I asked you every week because I, I know you're um a tactics guy. So what do you think of the lineup? How did we line up and how did it work for the first 60, 70 minutes of the game? Yeah, it was back to the way we started the season with the 3-4-2-1, 3-4-3. Um, and just a, a quick one minute refresher of what that looks like, because it is still quite new to a lot of people, that way of playing. Um, so we... We start with three central defenders. So for us, that's Dan Nimick, right centre back, Julian Dunn, central centre back, and Kale Loffrey, left centre back. Then we have four. So those four are two holding midfielders. So that was Lorenzo, um, not Lorenzo, that was Jeremy <laughs> and Rampy as our two holding midfielders. And then either side of them, we have our wing backs. So on the right, that's Zach Fernandez. On the left, that is um, Ryan Telfer, interestingly. Then in front of that line of four, we have two number 10s and they play quite narrow. And that was Massimo Ferrin and Aidan Daniels. And then at the point of that, the tip of that, we have Thiago Coimbra, who is our central striker. And the reason a lot of coaches like playing like this at the moment is because by having those two wing backs up and down, kind of imagine them up and down on a conveyor belt. And depending on the game state, they can drop into whichever line is most beneficial. So if you're defending, they they drop back into the defensive line. So then instead of a three, you have a five. 
if we're kind of progressing and building they can move up a line and be next to the two midfielders therefore we've got a four there or if we're in an attacking phase they can kind of be level with the strikers and the attacking midfielders so we've got a five across there and those two players down the wings they just move up and down up and down and they they kind of click in wherever they need to be at any given time um a lot of teams are playing like this at the moment i think it's a way of of kind of being dangerous on the exterior and also being quite kind of meaty in the middle of the pitch. But again, as we were saying last, as we were saying last week, as as much as this is a new formation, the principles are still the same as last year. It's still, it's still a three, two build and it's still a three box. There's still a box midfield. It just exists without anyone moving from wide areas and inverting. It exists outside of that. It just exists as it is like you don't have to move anyone anywhere to kind of form that box but that's still there the only change is kind of what the wide areas of the pitch look like um and it's a work in progress at the end of the day we're still we're still figuring it out but what i will say is this is becoming quite an in vogue way of playing so the reason Inter Milan have been so successful is because they play like this. The reason Bayer Leverkusen have been so successful is because they play like this. The reason Crystal Palace have got so much better lately is because they play like this. So when you've got all these coaches kind of trying to think of a way to move away from the peppy sort of 4-2-3-1, this is where a lot of the coaches are going. Um, But it is still a work in progress. And do you think that uh, the personnel that we're we're putting in is as our right personnel for what we're trying to do. Um on on the right side of the pitch, yes, because I think Zach Fernandez is born to play this position. He's born to be a right wing back. He's wasted if he's a right back who defends. And I don't think he's I don't think he's quite subtle enough to be a pure out and out right winger. His his strength lies in overlapping and having a lot of space to run into. Um, so it's the right side of the pitch, definitely the left side of the pitch to be confirmed, to be honest. Ryan Telfer has been playing us at left wing back. I think um, Riley Ferrazzo has given it a go. Wes has given it a go. I think in general, there's there's a it's overstating it to say there's a left sided problem that we have. I don't think it's a problem, but it it needs a lot more work than the right side of the pitch. Um Massimo Ferrin's best position if we play 3-4-2-1 I'm still not sure of and I know we've talked about that before he started as a left 10 a quite narrow left 10 and I think he had a really good game but again when I think of Massimo at his best he starts high and wide on the left and then cuts in aggressively and does he have the spaces to do that if he's playing in a kind of in the left half space in a smaller area I'm not sure I, but again, I still think he was probably our best player on on Saturday, to be honest. So defensively, we do have the personnel. I think those three central defenders are built to be in a to play in a three. I think it really hides some of the limitations that some of them have by allowing other central defenders to be the ball players and the builders. Um, are we going to get on to talk about Lorenzo? By the way, Lorenzo and the centre midfielders and that kind of. Because that's another, oh, we will. Okay, I won't make this the point I was going to make. Then I'll save it. But um, yeah, yeah. Like I, I thought, I'm um, just uh, flipping back to um, <clears throat> do, do, like uh, the the defender. I thought this was during mm-hmm. Dunn's best game for us. I thought he was excellent. Agreed. Um, I, I I thought that uh, as you said, like <clears throat> have a Massimo there from the start. Uh, b- big difference. Um, and it, it, the team just felt a lot more settled. I think that Patrice's point that he was making that this team won the league by 13 points for boy like last year. You could see it. They were they're a really good team and like they they kept the ball really, really well. And I you could see there was frustration, I think, uh, kind of and I think maybe that's what he's alluding to too, around the kind of stadium where we didn't always have we didn't have the ball that much. We were kind of chasing shadows for like a little bit and um as you mentioned, Charlie Trafford was definitely a big part of that. Like he was, he was excellent. But you know, the, the thing, Chris, I want to get your opinion on is like you know, the, the goal was a, a terrible goal that we gave away. Uh, it was it, everybody was just caught sleeping. Basically, it was a brilliant ball in, but we just got got caught sleeping. But the response was 
really what we needed. So I just kind of want to get your 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 opinion on did we change things to make that response, or was it just like characters just stood up and dragged us to that? Because you know, towards the end of the game, we were de most definitely like the the better team. <clears throat> I think that's the that it was like a double response because not only was it was the response to the goal, but the Nimic disallowed goal. Everybody's head could have went down. We all of us in the crowd were angry. We, you know, maybe we'll talk about officiating after, but the response to that was almost like it felt like two goals. And, and you know, you talk about how the season started point free. Some of the people behind me were like, "Okay, we'll take this draw. We'll take this draw." Yeah, hate to say that, but that was the mentality of some people and that release almost felt so, so good for the crowd because yeah, we got one against Ottawa. Yeah. We got a couple against St. Laurent, but they came in and uh, in a more negative, I'm trying to think of the right word cloud. I'll just use the term cloud. This one felt like a boost because of what you said, I think leading up to the goal, even I think even Calgary's goal to be completely honest was against the run of play. Um, they, when they made the Charlie Trafford substitution, having Camargo and Daly just basically running free in the center of the midfield, I, I had, I tweeted on Twitter and even mentioned on Facebook, the midfield battle in this game was exceptional, whether it was Shamit Shom just kind of running around doing his thing in the free roll, Charlie was basing things. And then when Charlie went, Shom took his spot, but the triangle with Camargo Daly and Shom was really, really difficult to stop. And like you said, Anthony, it was that one moment then cavalry showed their quality got the goal but for the majority of the time i thought that we handled their midfield quite well so we were talking about you know how are we going to do without lorenzo this midfield feels a little bit thin there's not a whole lot of depth um in terms of like pivots and roll wise and we don't really have that anchor how's rampy and jeremy going to work together blah 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 i felt like a lot of those questions were answered simply because i thought that cavalry could have dominated in the midfield but they didn't quite and I think one of the reasons is as the game went on, as the substitutions happened, and, you know, we've been one of my criticisms of Patrice early in the season, and, and I've heard a few other people speaking about it in other podcast waves, is the timing of the substitutions have been a little bit off. Not only do I think Patrice's substitutions were perfect, I think they were almost too perfect, if that makes any sense, because I feel like some of the guys that were substituted off were actually kind of working their way into the game, but they were setting that example as well, that response. And the guys that ended up coming on, and, and for the second time this season, Riley Ferrazzo comes in and just changes the complete dynamic of the game. That was something that personally I took as a, a, as a positive, obviously, but it's kind of the positive, it's kind of the one thing that stands out for me from the game is that just that response, that natural, we can not only get this goal back, but we can go on and win this. And we damn near did. Um, cavalry for all their quality, they're not necessarily off to the strongest start either. And I think it's because Tommy is also still trying to figure things out. The late season Meyer Bevan news obviously changed their entire attacking dynamic. It seems like week by week they're improving. It seems like week by week they're getting better but I think that we did a really frigging good job of matching their energy. And, and that to me is the part that stands out. But I think the one thing that changed, sorry, Anthony, I'm ranting now. Um, I found that Daniels and Farron were finally getting into pockets of spaces in the number 10 position. And like Gary said, that's not Farron's strongest position, but it was and strangely as the match went on, he found those pockets a little bit more. And to me, it almost unlocked, those runs that we weren't quite seeing when Valeski came on, he had fresh legs. He was making those runs. Telfer was able to overlap. I honestly thought that this was Telfer's best game um, so far, especially playing out of position. He didn't seem to put his head down. He, he was tracking back, playing well defensively. I just think that what we saw was the same tactic from the start, like Gary said, but a belief in that system. And now we're starting to see that belief bear fruit. So um, yeah, long winded answer, but I think the biggest change was once that pocket got open in the 10, um, the attacking, uh, angle started to flow. Yeah. Um, so, so Gary, I'll just go back to your point there. Like, you know, the elephant in the room with this game and also your next game is going to be the missing Lorenzo. And I think <clears throat> you can't not miss a player like that. Uh, it, it's, you know, he's, uh, one, like one of our best, if not the best player that we have. 
But how did uh, Jeremy and Rampy step up to kind of fill the void that he left behind? I think Chris was right, and there was an exceptional midfield battle. Felt like a bit of a chess game at times. Sometimes we would sit Massimo Ferran and Aidan Daniels on their two holding midfielders. Sometimes they would drop in their striker and one of their wingers onto our two holding midfielders. Jeremy got caught on the ball quite a few times early in the game because of that, because I felt like Kale was a pressing trigger for Cavalry and Jeremy to an extent was as well. They were especially trying to like, they were trying to angle him onto his right foot as well because they knew he wasn't as comfortable, especially when they're coming from behind him, releasing it on his right foot. He always wants to play it with his left foot. So they were kind of angling their press to, to attack him that way. And it had they had some success with it. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a little statistic here, which answers the question completely um so rampy and jgl on saturday between them they played around 80 passes lorenzo against pacific by himself played over 100 passes and that tells you exactly what you need to know um and i felt like i felt like we started the game by still trying to use those two holding midfielders as our kind of our conduits for for the game. We wanted to play through them still. But by Jeremy getting his pocket picked a few times, I think it spooked Jan and I think it spooked the centre-backs a little bit. So we started to go a bit more direct and Cavalry started to go a bit more direct as well because we were spooking them in the same way. Um, We were closing their holding midfielders down a bit as well. So I felt like as the game developed... Not even into the second half. I think this started to happen in the first half. Both teams started to go a little bit direct and it became became a bit of a second ball game. And what I mean by that is instead of being a game where you play one touch when you play on the ground, it became a second ball game in that you kind of go more direct into Telfer, for example. You trust him to win it or at least kind of knock it down into an area where you can win your duel and then you try and win the second ball. And that became the pattern of the game the more it developed. And I actually thought we did quite well in that because Telf is pretty good in the air. He's not the he's quite stocky, but he's pretty good in yep. the air. Tiago's fairly good in the air. I think he I think I think there is a development point for him there in the air, to be honest, because considering his size, I think he can be better in how he in how he prepares, like his preparation before the ball even comes to him, I think can be better in how he separates from his marker, how he kind of angles himself to be in an optimal position to win the header. There's a development point there, but he's still pretty good. So I I think to get around Lorenzo not being there, we went a bit more direct is the, the too long didn't read on that. I, I think the good thing with that though was it brought like some of the, best moments of the first half when it was a good old style football game where it was a bit of a traditional in the middle where we had like a spate of yellow cards, Charlie Tarford was being a bit of a shithouse and it really got the crowd going. I think everybody kind of got up on their feet after like the mysterious red card slash yellow card and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I, I, I miss, I miss football like that sometimes where it's just a good old like uh ding dong, I guess like, but uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I think it was like, our most enjoyable game to watch this year and uh that is an incredible statistic i i like you know it's funny like when you you kind of you see the game uh from the sidelines or you you rewatch it and you just don't think of those things that somebody shows you on a piece of paper to go like this is what this guy does and uh it's going to be difficult uh it's difficult to replace them and luckily our next game uh, I better bless myself. Uh, is against Valor. Uh, thank God we're not like playing a forward or, or something like that. Uh, Chris, you were going to say something there, man. Yeah, just real quick about the red card. We had no clue in the front on one hundred four that she reversed the decision. <laughs> so we all thought that Ryan Telfer was trying to stay on the field, <laughs> and he didn't even get the yellow. Who was it that got the uh, yellow? It was uh, Coimbra. Coimbra, but everybody yeah. in one hundred four thought it was Telfer. I just mistaken identity of distance, I suppose. But um, we, we, everybody, we were we were all counting. We were like one, two, three. Why do we still have eleven? And somebody, <laughs> somebody back in like row H or row I finally screamed down to us. It was a yellow. It was a yellow. And we were all like, "Hey!" You could actually hear like a quick cheer 
on the one soccer broadcast about a minute, minute and a half after she brandished the yellow. Um, but yeah, like, I, I don't know about you guys, but that sunken deja vu feeling from Ottawa hit me immediately. Cause I was like, Oh my God, here we go again. I know. Uh, I, but the good, the good thing is like, where the, the, where the patio is like where, where I kind of hang out is like, you're right by that big screen. So I'm trying to a big moment, uh, you know, to disallow goal, for instance, uh, hitting a crossbar. It, it, it's like you've got an action replay, so it is kind of nice being in that kind of section for, for that kind of stuff. But yeah, once the the red card went, everybody's like, no, 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 no. Like, and if you actually want, it was a pretty bad challenge in fairness. Uh, and we all our heads all swiveled around, going, "What the fuck?" And then we saw, our, yeah, and it was like, "Thank the, the sweet lord." But um, yeah, like I, I think overall, like uh, it was a really good performance. The goal. Like, you know, uh, we have to talk again about uh, Dan Nimick's contribution. He made a team of the week, uh, Gary, and we kind of talked about him stepping up, and that cross was a fucking peach. <laughs> yeah. He, he, he looks about three inches taller to me this season just because of how he's carrying himself and how he's taken on, or we talked about it last week, but how he's taken on a leadership position in the team. And it, he... He has much more of a presence than he had last season on the pitch. Um, he's very, very much our leader now. And we, we, in terms of the pass, like we've we've always known he's got that quality because he can play that pass from 20 yards further back and still land it wherever he wants to land it. Um, he's got that in his feet. He, you can tell he used to be a midfielder. He could play centre forward and he'd score 10 a season in this league. I honestly believe that. He's just an all-rounder is like, you know, in, you know, in cricket, you see at the all-rounders, yep. he's an all-rounder. That's, he can do absolutely everything. Um, and yeah, but, and do, 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 you know, the Probo header, you know who he reminded me of when he scored of World Cup 1982, the Italian bloke, Tarde you know, Tardelli, that famous oh, celebration yeah, where he like, yeah, can't believe it. Yeah. He reminded me of that so much. <laughs> it was such a beautiful moment. Uh, it, it, it was fantastic. Um, so we, we, we kind of, alluded there a little bit about just talking about officiating a little bit and uh you know going back to the disallow goal uh chris i just kind of want to get your thoughts on uh what what why the goal is allowed i guess would be the first one um and then it was like uh the the standard of refereeing this year uh has it improved is it as bad as what it was last year and sorry to throw to three topics at once but uh, as well like like there's never any like <clears throat> you never hear afterwards about from the referee inside of things it's just like we we, we talk about as fans going like another game with it and fans complain about rest all the time but there's no there's, there's no recourse for, for referees of like why this decision was made or apologies if they got something wrong. It's just like let's move on and forget about it. And that doesn't seem right to me. But um yeah, just just uh, I'm gonna give your toss there, my friend. I'll go backwards. Um only because early in the CPL's lifespan, we used to actually get some of that information, some of those reports, how the referees did. Sometimes referees got suspended, whether it was a missed call or, or losing control of a match or whatever else. But it seems like the the referees union have gotten really tight lipped or they've at least killed the mole, if you will, um, of leaking out uh, complaints or appeals against officials. Or, you know, I know that there was at least one instance during the third season where we appealed for a referee to ref one of our games because of how he ref the game previously. Of course, that wasn't approved. Um, but that's been approved in the league before. And I'm not talking on my ass when I say that. I've been told that twice by two separate people. So the issues have gotten to an administrative point. And it's where it's at the point now where I really, really hope that the eight owners or seven owners, I don't know how many owners there are now. There's so many clubs. Um, but the the ownership groups with the relationship they have with the CSA are having weekly conversations about this because we need some kind of, I I can't even think of the word, but like some sort of inquiry. Like I, I, I don't even know what you would, what you would call it, but there needs to be a stripping down of what's going on with officials in this country, because it's not only the, the CPL, but there's an aspiration for us to not only have Canadian players 
in some of the biggest leagues around the world, but to have Canadian refs refing in other leagues and refing in international tournaments. And we've had that over the last couple of years, but not to be rude, some of the worst officials are the ones getting those assignments. So is this an issue in every country or is this a CPL issue that's really exasperated because, you know, we watch every game. We've seen, you know, the, the Ryan, the Ryan Moore situation right now, there's no footage. There's been no actual explanation of why he got the red card. And there's been no explanation why the appeal wasn't approved. So he has a three game suspension, but you said it, Anthony, there's no, there's no recourse. There's no review. There's no publicity. Um, in, in, in a way we've been spoiled by other sports. Um, the NBA actually has like a last two minute committee and they come out publicly and say, we were wrong. We did this. We did that. They even have a precedent set where they've started a game from like two minutes left. The next time the two teams played because the referee's decision in that previous game was so bad, it affected the outcome. Um, there's, I, I guess, in a way more of a transparency in other sports because they have instant replay, they have VAR, but I think it's the basic things that our referees are missing. Um, We've had instances already this year where a referee doesn't go to a linesman or a fourth official to at least get a second opinion. And that second opinion might've changed the referee's mind. You know, you're taught to be a referee group. You are not one above your linesman or women. You're not one above the fourth official. Those four officials are supposed to work in one as one in tandem. And we're not seeing that in the CPL enough. And I think that that is a big issue. Um, I know some of these stadiums aren't necessarily quite as full as the Wanderers grounds is. I don't know if our officiating crews in this country are just not seasoned enough when it comes to playing in front of crowds. And maybe it's just us having our blue tinted specs on, but it seems and feels like some of these calls at the Wanderers grounds have a premeditation to them. Not that the referees are are setting us up for failure or anything, but like with the Nimic foul, for example, you just you, you had that feeling in your head. You see it in the Premier League. You see it in international competitions. The makeup call. You could just see the referee was looking for something to make that to blow that whistle because maybe the referee realized the original foul call wasn't correct. It's something that happens. It's a subconscious thing, but it happens, and we've seen it dozens of times, hundreds of times, millions of times. Examples all over the world. So. In regards to the Nimic foul, he there, there was nothing there. There was absolutely nothing there. And, and, you know, unlike the Ryan Moore situation, there were cameras on him. We had multiple replays, multiple angles. Nothing's there. And there was no inference or inclination or, or any will to go talk to the lines person. Because as far as I'm concerned, that's a match changing, game changing, early on in the year, season changing moment. So, um I don't know if I answered all three questions, Anthony, but like that's my mini rant. It's it's frustrating. It's getting old. I'm I'm hearing fans and reading fans online saying until the officiating improves, I'm not buying tickets. And you know, on one hand, it's it's like you know, well, that's not helping the boys. You know, if you want to be a supporter, you don't don't stop supporting the boys because the referees aren't doing their job. But at the same time, this is entertainment. And with entertainment, you want quality, no different than going to a movie or, or going to a concert. You want quality and the referees are not providing the quality in this country whatsoever. Yeah, I think, you know, um, it's been said before and, um, you know, it's still a young league and everybody's like grown together. But as Christian Jack said in response to Patrice's comments, you know, like, uh, if you want to grow this league and for it to be taken seriously, um, you know, there's certain things that have to happen. Uh, the media is one of them, and being able to ask critical questions, and also having a, 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 being able to question officiating when it's not correct. And we're not here, you know, I'm not here saying that ref, like referees are terrible and it's is is awful because there is genuinely good 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 referees in the league. It's just that when when they get things wrong, like there should be some way for them to say okay like we got this one wrong like apologies or this is the reason why this was given and it just seems to be like a lack of transparency for the fans and as fans i think we've every right to uh when as you said game changing decisions like find out what's the thinking behind it and i think it's something that the league's going to have to look at um to to stop this discourse of people getting frustrated and ranting online about refereeing and the quality of it 
if everything was just a little bit more open. So, you know, going forward, I think that's something that the league's going to have to address. Um, and I think as fans, it's something that we're going to have to start demanding as well. Because, you know, we demand X, Y, and Z from the players. We demand X, Y, and Z from the clubs. It should be no reference. It should be no difference for the uh, the level of refereeing. So, yeah, that's my little two cents on it too. Um, so we, we need to get into some questions here, uh, or else we'll be here all night. Uh, Gary, just before I do, uh, you said the Massimo and McFerrin was your man in the match. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Chris? I'm going to actually say Dan, just because. There could have been a hangover from the St. Laurent game. And I felt like he led by example, not more than everybody, but it it seemed like he couldn't put in a bad foot the whole match, whether it was the long ball in an attacking sense or defensively put in some great tackles. He was vocal um, and he made the game changing play to an extent. He had twice. Let's, let's be honest, twice. Um, I would say Dan, but I, I Farron would be like a one a. 1A. I uh, I know that Gary hates uh, goalkeepers, but uh, I thought this was a uh, a great game from Jan. He made some really important saves. Um, it, the one in the first half there, especially, was fantastic. And I think that um, off the back of was saying and other people saying that he's not had the best start of the season, I thought this was uh, back to his old self, and I think that he deserved uh, my man the match. So uh, first question, uh, Gary. Um, this is this is from CB uh, Keeper. There's two questions, so I'm going to give them to you both because one, uh, yeah, I, your favorite club to talk about. So, uh, can we talk about how Halifax continues to crush attendance figures in the CPL in spite of claims of being the best fans in the league by a certain delusional fan base? Uh, based on the capital, uh, others can draw similar numbers in spite of uh, rainy day refunds. What's the issue? So. We kind of we kind of talked this a little bit like last week when we were talking about uh, the CPL on tour, uh, but you know we are seeing dwindling numbers in in a lot of the markets. Uh, what do you think? Is it because of the early season blues and weather is not the best, or what do you think's going on there? I haven't have absolutely haven't got a clue, which doesn't make for good podcasting, to be honest. Um, huh. I I I know I've lived here for six years. I know I feel like I know. Nova Scotia and I know Haligonians quite well um what makes them tick but as for the rest of the country I've got absolutely no idea um I I I th- I obviously we come from places and which are completely dangerously obsessed with the sport and from London you've got however many clubs in well it's a high population but in a small area and they all sell out even like even a conference team in London would sell out. So in terms of my background, that's just normal. That's what people do. But I, I say that completely understanding that this is not even, I don't know, would it be like the fourth most popular sport in Canada? Yeah. I imagine. I, I, I'd say yeah, so, yeah. Baseball, yeah. hockey, basketball would all be, about, and probably NFL, CFL as well. So maybe the yeah. fifth most popular sport. So yeah, I mean it's it's a, it's a tough sell, isn't it? Especially in markets that are already quite saturated with sports teams, and I've I've heard Ottawa fans use that as an excuse sometimes as to why their their attendances are low. Because is there is there an NHL team in Ottawa? Is that yeah, the Senators? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but I mean, it it does kind of that. that I, I like I don't really like to get into those sorts of debates with the whole we're the best fans in the yeah. league thing. It's kind of, it gets a bit tiresome, doesn't it? If, if you have to say something that much, it's probably not true. Um, if it is, it kind of comes across as quite um, defensive, doesn't it? And like, they're trying to convince themselves. Like, yeah, we are, we are the best fans in the league. Aren't we? Yeah, we are. We really are. <laughs> um, but the proof is very much in the pudding there. Sorry, yeah, that's you, not a very good answer, mate. I apologize. You, you think it's like a, them clapping their hands at the ground, just them all slapping their backs at the back of the ground, uh, the, the around the ground for turning up. Yeah, but but you know, Ireland's had the Ireland's different than the UK because uh, the, the League of Ireland's been underfunded for like a long, long time, and uh, a lot of the clubs struggled for attendances, and attendance has been up for I would say like since the pandemic and just before too, uh, and it's because they're reaching out to younger kind of. 
late teens, early 20s kind of people as part of the culture of it all. Um, and the project on the pitch has got a lot better too. Um, and I think here, as I said, there's a lot to go up against. In Ireland, we've also got Gaelic football and hurling, which are two massive sports as well, and rugby. Um, but, you know, I, I think that maybe here they tend to focus in on the family aspect of it. Um, and if it's pissing in rain... Uh, a family isn't going to go to a game, which is why I think Ottawa came along and did this rainy day refund, and they've had really bad weather for the majority of the game so far. So I think that's part of the reason. I think coming into the later part or the middle of the summer, it'll get better. To be perfectly honest, and yeah, uh, you, you need to you need to like you said identify people who do market research need to identify with a casual fan why they're not why they're yeah. not coming. Like I, I I was listening to a podcast the other day, and it was kind of. It was about football in the 80s. And in the UK, football in the 80s, there was a massive, massive attendance drop. Like even Arsenal were down to like 12, 13,000 supporters come in. And it was a very, very obvious reason why. It was because hooliganism has got so bad that it was dangerous going to games in the 80s because you yep. could get stabbed or punched or it was just a horrible environment. So the governing bodies, they spent 10 years addressing that for better and worse, like ticket prices have gone way up as a result of that, which is again, good and bad, but they address hooliganism. They identified the problem and then attendances shot back up after Italia 90 because the grounds got safer. So I don't know what the reasons are, why, why the games aren't more popular, but market researchers, the great business minds of the league, they need to identify that and work backwards from that point. I'm not going to lie. I'm surprised by the success of the Wanderers. Only because, and I'm not hating on Halifax, the market, but being a Moosehead season ticket holder myself for about a decade, and I worked with the club as well doing 50-50, I've seen the ebbs and flows of the Mooseheads. I've seen that rink with almost 11,000 people in it. I've also seen that rink with just over 1,500. We're a fickle city. It's why professional basketball has come and gone. It's why... We've never been able to actually bring a minor league baseball team here, despite there being rumors for like 20, 25, 30 years. That's why minor league hockey doesn't survive here because minor league hockey is literally based on ticket sales. It's the only way teams can survive. And if a team's not playing good, Halifax hasn't traditionally been a team to support a non-winning program. So I give Derek and everybody that he's hired, including our friend Marvin, Dylan as well. I, I, I mean, we could talk about what Dave has done for the club. You look at what Trevor and Jeff are doing from a more hands-on aspect. And then everybody else around. I'm forgetting millions of names, probably. The people that Derek have put in place to promote, push, and build this fan base, they all deserve every award that's available to them. And I do foresee a time in the future, whether Derek sells off the club or whatever happens, that he will become a commissioner and or president of some kind of entity Maybe he'll still own the Wanderers, but be in some sort of sports and entertainment field. Maybe SEA is going to be the leader in, in national promotion. Whatever the hell these guys have done to maintain this fan base through four years of not great success, from seeing how the Rainmen have come and gone, the Mooseheads, they're, they're, you know what I'm saying? There's just something with the Wanderers that Derek has been able to trigger, and it's refreshing but it's also really surprising. So like what CB is saying is, you know, what are we doing right? I don't know because it's even a surprise to somebody like myself who's, who I, I've spent my whole life here. Um, you know, th there were some worries after the third year into the fourth year that attendances were going to drop and they never dropped at all. Patrice peaked them and now this year season tickets are sold out. So I don't know. I don't know what he's done. Um, and, and I really, really hope that he's kind of like the voice in the spearhead for the rest of the league to try to get themselves on the track because whatever he's done, man, he's a genius. Derek is a genius. Yeah. Um, the second part of the question, uh, I picked Bolesky to be in the running for the goal and boot, but he's had a bit of a slow start. Uh, what's their best midfield setup to leverage his style as striker? Wait, what is he? He's, um, He's an off-the-shoulder striker and he's a penalty box striker. I don't think his hold-up play is the best, so you don't want to be going long into him. You want you want plays who can kind of slide it, 
slide it through to him so he can run on and score or players who can overlap and cross it into him and he can score that way. Um, so the best midfield setup, Pro- Probo's probably got the cutest sort of pass on him, hasn't he? The most subtle pass. So Probo definitely behind him. I find Aiden Daniels is more of like a driver. He drives at defenders and I think he probably wants to get the shot off himself. Um, so I, I won't necessarily the best midfielders to get the best set out of him, but the two players who can get the best out of him, Robo as a 10, because he's got that kind of slide pass and Zach Fernandez as a right wing back. Cause I think he's the one that will overlap and cut the ball back to someone like Valesky who's arriving. Um, I answer. thought his cameo was good too, for what it's worth. I, yeah, it's, it looked yeah. the best he's looked, definitely. And I think he was carrying an injury in preseason, so he's he's still getting fit. He's still learning his teammates. They're still learning him. So very, very early days. Like, I've got a lot of patience. Yeah, and this one's from uh, Derek Simon. Um, you kind of touched on the first part of his question. Um, this one... <clears throat> Uh, so aside from the subs, what changed the game? We kind of we kind of talked a little bit about that, but uh, how do we replicate how we played? I guess in the last twenty minutes, uh, over ninety, Chris. That's a good question, actually. Um, I saw more positivity in the whole ninety, but it seems like it's kind of a general opinion of the fan base that you know, even not not even when Cavalry scored, but like about five, ten-ish minutes before Cavalry scored, the winds were starting to change. Um, how to replicate that over 90 minutes, that's a that's a tough one um, because sometimes you extract the best out of your tactics by bringing somebody on as a sub. So maybe that ends up being the formula. Um, Derek, like I, one of our criticisms of Pat, as I mentioned before, so far this season has been the way the subs were administered. I was personally a big fan of the way they were administered versus Cavalry. I'm not um, certain if if Derek felt the same way. Um, but I think that the willingness to, I don't want to say bang your head against the wall, but it worked against Cavalry where he persisted almost with the game plan, persisted with what he was going into the match with because he felt that it was going to actually bear fruit against Pacific. It should have had, we should have had a goal or two. You know, I, I can go game by game. We've done it 101 times, right? Um, so I think that, even though the players are learning each other, the players are chemistry. I think Patrice is also learning how to coach these guys. So finding that bridge from halftime to about the 60, 70th minute, um, who, who are my best players to come off the bench? Who's going to provide me that energy? You know, I could think of guys off the top of my head, like Riley Ferrazzo, Camillo, when he came on against Ottawa, he seemed to change the directiveness of things. I think Patrice is still learning his squad. He's still learning his options what weapons to keep in the chamber and what ones to actually expose. So to, to answer Derek's question, um, and, and we saw this last year, we built into matches. Uh, I think that Patrice is showing so far this year that that's still sort of the same formula, sort of the same strategy. So once the the tactical base and everybody's a little more comfortable with that tactical base and it gets a little more solidified, then maybe we see those risks that Pat's taking later in the match Maybe it's last 10 minutes of the first half or something, right? Um, but it's a hard question to answer because we don't really know um, Pat's mentality with his bench yet. I think it's uh, it's something he's still trying to develop. Good answer. Uh, this one, Gary, is from Josh Laska. Um, he got his questions in earlier this week. So <clears throat> this is actually a good question. Uh, given context, is Provo's goal one of the biggest for the club so far? Yeah, I think you could. I think you could argue it is. I mean, how would we all be feeling now if we were looking at five defeats on the bounce? Would be feeling pretty terrible. But instead, we got a draw against the team that won the league again, like Patrice said, by thirteen points last season. And suddenly, everything's feeling a bit rosier. We're playing a team that's very beatable on Monday. If we beat them, we're on four points only. I think two points off a playoff spot, and it's. It's funny how quickly your life can change, isn't it? And how suddenly we're a, we're a contender for the playoff spots again, instead of being <laughs> rooted to the bottom of the league. Um, so yeah, it's an it's an incredibly important goal for morale, for points on the board, for league standing. So yeah, I think that's a good I think that's a good shout. 
And then the second part of the question, Chris, uh, thoughts on the difference Coimbra makes returning as the nine? Kind of touched on that a little bit, but uh, just your thoughts. Yeah, once he gets into form, it's just a different dynamic. It's a, it's a, pardon the the term, a beefier pace. He wasn't scared to actually get on the heels of the center backs. I thought he gave Cobbs a, a a big issue. Cobbs is an incredible player, and he made him feel uncomfortable multiple times. Um, I do feel we talked about this in the chat. Um, Patrice has done a really good job harnessing him because we've seen him in training, we've seen him in exhibition matches. He is a bull. A, 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 I'm t- stealing a term from you, Gary. A bull in a china shop. He just wants to put his head down and run after that ball. And if he takes a foul or even takes a yellow card here or there, he's that type of player. I saw a maturity. Um, we didn't really get to see him as much as we wanted to last year. Uh, but I saw and kind of recognized it during the preseason, um, whether it was the training sessions or the the friendly matches, the exhibition matches, that there was a maturity there, a more of a patience there. And we kind of saw that uh, against Cavalry where it's really easy to get, I don't want to use the term bored, but anxious almost and make that mistake. And I saw at times Coimbra even pointing to Farron and Daniels putting them into positions, making sure they're in the right spots. So if he makes that commitment that someone's there, I was really, really impressed by his performance. You could see that there's still maybe that step off, that timidness. His finishing isn't quite as crisp as we all thought it was, but as a young striker, finding where to pull the trigger and how to pull the trigger, that's something that just comes naturally and obviously comes with more game time, more playing time. Um, the striker position has been a volatile one, similar to left back. It seems like Pat's still trying to figure out who, what, when, where, and why. And I think Tiago put himself, uh, at least in Pat's consideration for, you know, like Gary said, his teams aren't built to press, but to have a player that can press, to have a player that finds the right situations to press, it requires a maturity and a patience. And I think Coimbra showed both in spades. Awesome. Um, so, Gary, uh, opposition corner. Go ahead, my son. <laughs> Outstanding. Um, okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, once again for joining me for an episode of Opposition Corner. This will be a short one because, um, I, I full disclosure, I watched the first 20 minutes of York versus Valor on my lunch break yesterday and the entire opposition corner is based on those 20 minutes. So just that disclaimer in place. Um, Valor are a 4-2-3-1 team, much like Cavalry. Interesting thing about Valor is that their off-the-ball shape is exactly the same as their on-the-ball shape. This isn't as common as you probably think it is. Most teams, if they're a 4-2-3-1 on the ball would become like a 4-4-2 or 4-4-1-1 off the ball. Valor do not do that. They they stay exactly as they are in a 4-2-3-1 shape. Very easy to see. I, I encourage anyone who has time, watch the first 20 minutes. It's it's They're very structured, is what you can say about them. Um, a benefit of that is I think it's quite easy to play around and through that 4-2-3-1 structure. If, if you... If, if you kind of bypass the holding midfielders because the holding midfielders will have three Valor players around them. So bypass them and try and play into your tens. They should have a lot of joy. Um, I would lay money on the fact that our centre-backs will have the most touches in this game out of anyone. Our centre-backs are going to see a lot of the ball because Valor, like us, they don't really press. Their, um, Their PPDA, which stands for passes per defensive action so how many passes do they allow the opposition to play before they do a defensive action to win the ball back is 15 passes which is i think the most in the league if you look at someone like ottawa who are the pressiest team their ppda is eight so they allow eight passes before a defensive action valor is 15 so they don't really press what they do is they're kind of their striker just kind of Fair is his way around. He'll kind of half follow the ball between the centre backs without ever really engaging. And it's at the second phase that they like to jump in when the ball kind of hits the central midfielders. That's when they try to press. So I imagine we'll bypass 
our holding midfielders quite a lot. I, I actually see it becoming a similar game to the cavalry one in how we go a bit more direct and look for second balls to drop into our tens and and build from there. Um, at the end of the day with Valor, I think we can, as much as we talk about tactics and systems and blah, 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 talent wins you football matches. So as good as Dos Santos is, and I think he's a very good coach, he reminds me of Alan Cock. Um, the old Edmonton coach, to be honest. Um, good coach in a bad situation. Very good coach. Very structured team. But at the end of the day, if you don't have the talent, you won't win many football matches. And I think, again, much like Edmonton, that's what's happening to them at the moment. We have better individuals, and I think we need to trust that. I don't think we need to overthink this game tactically. I think we can trust that our players are better than their players and hope that's enough to get us over the line. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Gary, for that. Um, just going to wrap up here. Uh, I did want to say um, the uh, the announcement of the Canadian men's national team uh, new head coach was very uh, underwhelming. A fucking FaceTime was was odd. Great. Congrats to Angus McNabb, who uh, quietened the, the haters down as being part of that uh, uh, team that brought in uh, a, a top quality coach, I think. Um, I did also want to say uh, condolences to a uh, friend of the show and uh, York United assistant coach uh, Maro uh, uh, Eustachio is uh, his father passed away, and uh, it's a very sad news. Um, yeah, um, looking forward to us getting that first win on the board. Um, I won't be at the game on Monday because I have to work. So, and I'm also, like last Saturday, uh, they did a half price uh, gin spritzies. I drank way too fucking many of those. I, I think I had like, uh, I think I had like four of the fucking things. I was not well. I was an, <laughs> I was an unwell man when I got home. And uh, Sarah was not, not too happy with me, so... Uh yeah, I won't be uh I won't be doing that again. Jack Barrett, the uh the goalkeeper, he was a surprise inclusion for uh for Calvary. It was kind of cool because behind the goal there was people there from the Everton Supporters Club, and he's obviously on loan from Everton, and mm-hmm. people from the Liverpool Supporters Club. So he was getting chirps and plaudits uh in equal measure. It was kind of fun. Can I can I just as you mentioned him? Can I just give a shout out to to Becca? And I think we've referred to. Her- as Becca of the kitchen previously, she had a fantastic tweet after the Probo goal, which was because they talked about him having the 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 song. And speaking of Nova Scotia songs, Barrett's Private Tears. Yeah, I did see that. That was very uh, well played. Absolutely amazing. Uh yeah, so um yeah, I, I won't be there. Uh I also drunkenly because we had Callum uh, Montgomery on the show before. He was doing like his uh warm down afterwards. Callum, can we get a picture? And I I, I think he literally wants to go tell me to fuck off because I was being really <laughs> really annoying. So uh apologies to Callum Montgomery. So yeah, I saw you I saw your Instagram post afterwards with all your football friends. I know football friends. Oh, yeah. My 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 eyes look not the kind of glaze over. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so um, great show, lads. Appreciate you uh, hanging out. Uh, and uh, come on, you wanderers. Thank you, mate. Come on, boy, boys, boys in blue. Oh, my God.